to, um, I'm looking forward to be told the difference between, <laughs> no, I, 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 we will all be told the difference between uh, an impact model and a climate model, and we we're going to be told this difference by um, Carla Berindt. There you go. Thank you. Um, yeah, hello and welcome, everyone. I would like to see my slides. Are these slides? Ah, okay, <laughs> nice. Um, so welcome everyone to my talk about climate modeling, the science behind climate reports. Um, first of all, I will shortly introduce myself and what I do. I work at the UFZ, that's the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig. And I work for the ESM project, which is short for uh, Advanced Earth System Modeling Capacity. I'm also a PhD student at the University of Potsdam. And I'm part of the developed, uh, developer team uh, for the Mesoscale Hydrologic Model, which is an impact model. And I'm also a scientist for future and an artist. So what this talk is about, short, uh, this to uh, talk is uh, partitioned into three sections, mainly. Uh, first is the introduction where I will uh, introduce some nomenclature, like what is weather, what is climate, and um, what we can say about predictions, for example, why we can't tell the weather in three years. But we can say something about the climate and what are climate models. Then the second part will be the longest, the science behind warming graphs. I will show you a graph that's typically shown uh, when people to tell you about climate change, and uh, I will explain that graph in detail and what is behind it. Uh, the third part uh, would be installing an impact model to your local PC if there's time. If there's no time, I will skip that. Uh, and in the end, uh, there's, as always, a summary and conclusion. So starting with the introduction. Um, weather is defined as the physical state of the atmosphere at a given time, whilst climate is average weather. Most of the time, a uh, time period of uh, 30 years is taken for that averaging, but also other time periods could be taken. Um, so. While the, the main question was, while we are not able to predict weather at a specific date in a decade, for example, let's say the 27th of December in 50 years or so, why does it still make sense to propose general trends for the climate? Uh, that is a question that all, uh, often arises. Uh, when, uh, um, and I'll answer that. So first of all, um, it is about average, average cloud coverage. Um, gives us information on average reflection, and average reflection is, uh, 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 has an impact on the warmth on the Earth. And the same is true for uh, another scenario, for example, average precipitation, meaning rain or snow, and temperature has an impact on vegetation, and vegetation influences the carbon cycle, and that again influences the warming or cooling, and that uh, has an influence on the ice coverage, and that, again, on the re reflection. So there are lots of processes that are uh, connected to each other. And if we know something about the average of some uh, of this physical state of the atmosphere, we can say something about uh, the climate trends. Um, so the question is, what is a climate model? And the AR5 uh, defines a climate model as a numerical representation of the climate system. The AR5 is a source I will uh, cite quite often, so I short, uh, have one slide with the whole uh, citation. It's uh, the fifth IPCC report. Um, IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and um, uh, the fifth assessment report uh, is, yeah, so AR5 is the abbreviation for fifth assessment report. Um, by coming back to a climate model, so a climate model could, for example, be a, a GCM, a general circulation model, which is a global climate model that uh, usually uh, consists of um, ocean and atmosphere circulation. Um, an RCM 
is not a GCM, but it's a regional climate model, meaning a climate model at a limited area, and mainly it has a higher resolution. And uh, for it is at a limited area, that usually means that there is some input and output going in because it's not a closed system. And an impact model, again, has usually a higher resolution in time, uh, time and space, and it's not a climate model, but it's for simulating extreme weather events like floods. So if you want to build a, ban, a dam or a dike, and uh, you want to know uh, how high this uh, dike or, or dam should be, then uh, you would uh, usually run an impact model that gives you information about water heights uh, in, uh, uh, over decades or longer or so, and then um, you would decide on the height. So this is the use for impact models. So that's for the introduction part. Now I come to the main part. Um, and I will start with a question, is it proven? Or with the climate graph. Uh, as said, um, I will show you a graph, a typical image people would show you when they address climate change. Uh, this graph has an X uh, axis with a time scale, and you see it's reaching far into the future. Uh, and it also uh, has t uh, three or four regions. Uh, and the first region is only in the past. And uh, the y-axis is uh, the global surface temperature change, meaning um, uh, how much degrees in Celsius, or in Kelvin, if the, it's, it's a difference, it's the same, uh, we will have in future, or we had already. Um, and then you see uh, several lines in different colors, and uh, with um, uh, the names RCP something. And I will explain all the numbers and everything about this graph, because it's a pretty important graph. Um, so first of all, I will tell you, no, no, I will tell you something about the numbers and uncertainties. The uncertainties are the uh, uh, transparent um, colors behind the lines. Uh, I will tell you something about the representative concentration path, uh, pathways, which is short RCP, and uh, so it's reflecting the uh, colors of the lines. I will tell you something about the source of the graphs, so where does this graph actually come from, so I will tell you something about the assessment purpose. Um, and first of all, I will answer the question, is it proven or is there scientific evidence that we will face that climate change? So um, you will see that graph quite often. First of all, I took a definition for proof for scientific evidence from Wikipedia. Uh, the strength of scientific evidence is generally based on the results of statistical analysis and the strength of scientific controls, meaning you make an experiment over and over again, and you change basically some, uh, some influences on the experiments where you want to know that this does not influence the output. Uh, so you can narrow it down and know what is uh, the source of your results, and so you can prove a physical law or something. Um, yeah, I took this uh, comic from uh, XKCD because it's uh, a nice, um, uh, it's somehow connected. So there's a person who pulls the trigger and then got thrown by a, a bolt or something, something bad happens, for example, climate change. And um, then, yeah, there are two, two scenarios. For example, a person usually would decide, okay, okay, I would not pull the lever again. But scientists usually, or more often, would say, okay, maybe does that happen every time if I do so? Um, because, yeah, that's basically how you prove something, or uh, that's experiments. But in case of climate change, even scientists say you shouldn't, although it's pretty interesting from a, from a scientific perspective, but the problem is we only have one Earth. We, we cannot do this experiment very often, uh, except we had a time machine. Then we could go back. But we haven't, so we shouldn't do that experiment. Um, and that's something uh, a scientist before long ago in 1957 said already, human beings are now carrying out a large-scale ge geophysical experiment of a kind that could not have happened in the past nor be reproduced, reproduced in the future. So another question is, 
yeah. Um, if you ask this question, if it is proven or that it probably is not happening or so um, to climate deniers, they usually would tell you, okay, maybe it's not happening, and uh, the other side would uh, take the position and ask you, okay, if you stand in front of a road and you want to cross the road and there is a car approaching very fast, would you cross that road? Because it could happen that that car stops or makes a U-turn or something, but, um, well, usually it doesn't, and Sadly, we know lots about this, um, this experiment because it's done very often before we know something about uh, traffic and that is pretty dangerous. So let's change the factors a little so that we don't know so much about that situation. Let's say a cube approaches us with a high velocity on something that is maybe not a road. Would you still cross the something? Um, and the answer is... Um, you still probably wouldn't, and why wouldn't you do so, although you know nothing about this situation? Well, you do know something. You know, you know conservation of the momentum, which is a physical law you know about. So you have a situation you know not so much about, you have not, never had an experience before, uh, but you still are able to make some uh, assumptions because you know the physical laws behind it. And that's basically the same we do with, uh, uh, in fact, uh, in uh, the context of climate. So we have, let's say, just an Earth and the Sun, and the Sun uh, yeah, uh, has some radiation and that comes to the Earth and gets partially reflected, and the Earth radiates itself because it has some temperature. We know something about this uh, Sun, we know the solar installation, and uh, we know uh, parts of the light is reflected and uh, the factor that is reflected is usually called albedo. Uh, so the reflected energy is albedo times the solar insulation, and uh, albedo is something about 30%. And we know uh, then that the light that is observed must be all the remaining uh, energy, so the energy of the surface is 1 minus albedo times uh, the solar insulation. Um, then knowing Stefan Boltzmann law for energy emissions, uh, where uh, the temperature goes in to the power of four, uh, and with the Stefan Boltzmann constant, we can actually find, uh, uh, find out uh, the surface temperature, which then is derived to minus 19.5 degree of Celsius. Well, we know, probably we know, that the Earth is much warmer, and that's because our model in this case, which is maybe a climate model, is far too simple. Um, so we change something about that. We add atmosphere. And atmosphere has some interesting impact. So atmosphere uh, um, has some trace uh, greenhouse gases, for example, CO2, but also H2O, ozone, methane, O2, and nitrous oxide. Um, and these greenhouse gases reflect uh, the radiation of Earth back to Earth, partially. Meaning uh, the atmosphere has a transparency, and this transparency, we call T, is something between 15% and 30%, so it's not fixed. And that's another interesting fact. Um, the atmosphere emits energy, um, which we call J atmos, and that uh, goes, uh, the, uh, um, goes out in space, and to Earth. And uh, the energy that goes into the atmosphere is 1 minus the transparency times the energy. Um, so we know two equations. The first is uh, the energy that goes into the atmosphere also goes out of the atmosphere. The second is um, that the surface temperature, uh, no, the surface energy of the Earth is the term we had before, 1 minus albedo times the solar insulation, plus the, ener the one part of the energy that is reflected by the atmosphere. And so we have two formulas, uh, two equations with two unknown, and with a Stefan Boltzmann law from before, we can derive the surface temperature, which is 15 degrees of Celsius. And that actually is not so far from uh, what it actually is. Uh, in, 2000, in 2000, it was measured that the surface temperature is 14.5 degrees. So I did this for a specific T, uh, with, which is 22.5%, uh, 
Uh, but when we change that T a little to, for example, 20%, so we add more CO2 because, for example, we would add a factory that would uh, do carbon emissions, uh, then uh, the ten uh, transparency goes down and the temperature rises to, for example, 16.6 .6 degree in case of 20%. Um, this is also uh, a very old um, knowledge. So this is uh, maybe a little much on a slide, but it's still very interesting because it's copied directly from uh, a paper that was published from Svante Ahenius um, in 1896 already. And it's on the influence of carbon acid and the air upon the temperature of the ground. And carbon acid is the old term for carbon dioxide. So if we have a look to um, the percentage, uh, so he investigated um, what if we change uh, carbon dioxide? So what is the impact of our behavior? Uh, let's say uh, carbon dioxide would, uh, the, um, uh, the carbon dioxide in our di atmosphere would uh, double, so the, uh, would increase by a factor of two. Then the average temperature rise in Leipzig in December, uh, so uh, Leipzig, I, I choose the region for Leipzig, would be 6.1 degree. Um, well, that's probably a little high, but what we can see is already that uh, Arrhenius back then already know, knew that, that, uh, that there is a seasonal impact on climate, uh, uh, that, uh, that is, uh, climate change is seasonal and also spatial. Uh, so it is not just uh, one, uh, not the average temperature is the only interesting um, um, not, um, knowledge we get. So... Arrhenius said something like the temperature in case of carbon acid uh, uh, doubled would be around 4 to 6 degrees and the current uh, models predict something like an increase for uh, um, 2 to 4 degrees for that scenario. So there's maybe an overlap already with that simple model from back then. So um, then I come to the question, a climate model represents physical laws, that's what we learned. Where do the uncertainties come from? So if we know all the physical laws and we would uh, just calculate everything with these physical laws, why are there even uncertainties? And there are some reasons for that. For example, the initial conditions is one main source of uncertainties, meaning how is the current state of the climate system now? Uh, how fast? does something move? Where are the clouds exactly? And so on. We don't know these precise initial conditions and therefore from um, errors here. Second would be the resolution and, uh, of a model. So the temporal and spatial step length. Um, meaning um, we can't, so, uh, we always represent our climate system with uh, differential equations and we approximate everything. We have uh, not uh, the movement of every molecule, but we have some average on cells. And if we increase uh, the resolution, uh, then usually um, uh, the uh, uncertainties go down, but sometimes they even don't. For some, question, uh, for some questions, it's better to have a lower resolution, but mostly it's better to have a higher. Then truncation, so we have computational limits um, and lack of understanding. For example, uh, clouds. Clouds are not understood pretty well, and when I read uh, the fifth assessment report, I found the sentence I found a little amusing. Um, climate model, um, clouds and climate models usually tend to rain too early. Um, yeah. So. But if you know all these um, um, sources of uncertainty, why is there no such thing as the one best climate model? Meaning, why can't we go to the highest resolution and to the uh, best uh, um, uh, the, the best computer we get and do all, everything just in the best way? And then we would have our best uh, climate model. And there are some. Uh, reasons for that, for example, the so-called dynamic core, including the method for uh, differ uh, differential equations, 
or something like grids. For example, if we have a, a triangular grid uh, or a um, rectangular grid. On rectangular grid, we usually can, be, um, can calculate faster, but on triangular grid, we could, for example, increase the resolution locally. Um, that might be differences. Um, and both has advantages and disadvantages. Also, the parameterization parameters, and the, our last slides were, for example, the T and the albedo, which will probably be not the final parameters because they are derived from other parameters, but uh, physical laws or something are often represented by rules with parameters, and these parameters can be estimated. Um, and they can be calibrated with uh, different error measures. And there are, this is another reason for uh, uncertainties and differences in climate models. And then there are schemes. For example, there are different formulations of physical processes, for example, again, clouds. Uh, and last, uh, the truncation again. We can also decide how we limit due to our comp uh, lack of computational power. So, yeah, what do we do? Um, we investigate all the models we have. So there are different climate models that are um, representing our climate. And we take all the models that match certain conditions. I come to that later. And uh, we average the output. And then we get um, a climate um, a projection and also that uncertainty band you see. So what climate models do we investigate? They are so-called coordinated uh, GCMs, or uh, uh, that are uh, so climate models are compared in so-called uh, coupled model intercomparison projects in different phases. Uh, uh, these coupled model intercomparison projects are called uh, CMIP uh, four, five, and six. Um, so they might have been for early ones, but currently, uh, currently um, for the AR six, uh, for, so for the sixth assessment report. Um, uh, 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 CMIP 6 is investigated. And for, um, the, I showed you on the map uh, the research centers which took part in uh, CMIP 6, so which take part in uh, the sixth um, assessment report. Um, these uh, research centers are mainly specialized research centers, university, and uh, meteorological offices. But in general, it's open for any institution to participate as long as they follow a protocol for their contribution, where there are some rules so you cannot just do anything. Uh, these institutions need to produce variables for a set of defined experiments and a historical uh, simulation uh, from 1850 to present. Um, this blue part is a link, so if you go to my slides afterwards, you can see this. Um, um, uh, variables you need to reproduce. And then you can do so something like this. So we have a graph here again. Um, on the x-axis, uh, we the, see uh, again a time scale that reaches from 1850 to today. And on the y-axis, we again see the temperature anomaly or the temperature difference uh, between um, uh, so the, exactly the tem temperature difference, so how um, much uh, the Earth has warmed up. Um, we see CMIP 3 and CMIP 5 compared, which were the um, uh, models that were investigated for the AR5. Um, so we see a band. Um, so uh, this uncertainty um, with the yellow and bluish in the background. And then we see uh, these uh, two lines, the um, blue and the um, red one from CMIP 3 and CMIP 5. And then we see the black one, and that is what actually was observed. And we see that this differs quite a lot. And that's due to there was only investigated the natural forcings, meaning uh, excluded what the human did. And if we also put the human forcing into it, then it's quite matching. And that is the best kind of proof we can get. And uh, again, I said, we investigate the physical laws. Um, and the physical laws were um, actually results of uh, scientific experiments. 
And so, yeah, there is this kind of proof. And, yeah. Um, so maybe in a little addition, um, there are also other coordinated uh, model intercomparison projects uh, then, uh, so outside of the IPCC, uh, and uh, so, so as all uh, one are inside the IPCC, where um, the scientific focus is on uh, subtopic uh, on something like land surface, for example, and that's what uh, I do. Uh, and um, there are also uh, there is also published work outside from IPCC. So back to the graph. We talked about the part, is it proven? And I hope I convinced you that this, it is. And um, now I will talk about the sources of the graph. So I talked a lot about the IPCC. Um, the IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, um, uh, published uh, reports. So the fifth, um, for example, the fifth assessment report and what you see here is part of the cover. But um, there have been four ones before, as the name fifth um, suggests. Um, the first assessment report, FAR, was published in 1990. Uh, the second, SAR, in 1995. Uh, then there was the TAR. And then for the first, first, fourth assessment report, they changed the name scheme for some reason to AR4. Uh, and then there was AR5 which I'm talking about. The IPCC consists of several working groups, including uh, working group one, two, three, uh, providing the assessment reports. And I mainly focus on the assessment report from working group one, um, which investigates the scientific aspects of the climate system and climate change. But there's also a working group uh, investigating on vulnerab uh, vulnerability, uh, and economic impact, and the uh, third one um, on the options of limiting greenhouse gas emissions and others. So I shortly show you a history of um, the climate models. For in, in something the mid uh, 50, uh, 70s, uh, climate models were investigated where there was just an atmosphere, the sun, rain, clouds were missing, and CO2 emissions. And uh, I hope you believe that the sun is behind the atmosphere and not in this atmosphere. Um, for in the mid-80s, uh, there was uh, prescribed ice added and already clouds and land surface. And yeah, you see a nice mountain, but actually in that time, um, the resolution was so low that uh, the Alps only had one or two um, grid cells, meaning there was not so much about land surface, but it was added. And for the first, uh, for, uh, first assessment report, uh, there was a swamp ocean added, meaning an ocean was added, but it was, had no depth. Um, for the second assessment report, uh, the, uh, the ocean uh, got some depth, so it was a normal ocean with surface uh, circulation, and there was added volcano activity and sulfates. For the third, assessment report that was added. So um, this is all about um, wh which kind of processes were um, there on um, climate models there that were investigated in this uh, assessment report, meaning there were climate models before that already had so those uh, processes uh, included, but they were not investigated in the assessment reports. So this is a history of which climate models or which processes and climate models were investigated in assessment reports. And the third uh, assessment report, there was uh, another circulation added for the ocean, the overturning circulations, and there were rivers added, which is interesting because I do something with rivers, uh, and um, there were aerosols added and um, a carbon cycle, meaning that the carbon that goes into the atmosphere also goes in, out, but yeah, not everything, or the half, uh, the half time is not so good. Uh, for the AR4, uh, uh, there was uh, chemistry added in the atmosphere and interactive vegetation. And for the AR5, there was ozone added and biomass burning emissions. And uh, there's uh, 
history of processes, but there's also a history of computer modeling that might be really interesting. It started more or less in 1904 uh, with uh, Wilhelm Diakens, who um, found equations that could be solved to obtain future states of the atmosphere. And he thought about that, um, yeah, maybe these equations are really hard to solve, and that tasks should be split and distributed to many people. So he basically imagined a human computer. And then Louis Fry Richardson came in 1922 and did actually calculate all that. This did a six hour forecast solving the equations by hand alone in 42 days user time, meaning he himself calculated uh, 42 days on it, but that 42 days were distributed over two years in total. Um, so he was a little behind the weather only to find out that it didn't give the correct answer. That was long forgotten, um, but, uh, and, and people said, yeah, that's not quite practical, we cannot do that. But then computers came in uh, 1950, the first successful weather model was run on a computer called ENIAC, and in 1950, weather predictions were run twice a day on an IBM 701. Nowadays, we use supercomputers much larger, and yeah, there, there's a whole list in, in the rank, and I will shortly introduce Jules to you, uh, the Ulich Wizard for European Leadership Science. That's a supercomputer in Ulich, and I would have shown you a picture, but you are not allowed, you, you are not simply allowed to take picture, pictures on that campus. Uh, but th since supercomputers are fancy, shiny cupboards anyway, I thought this is okay. Um, so we have these cupboards that look yeah, like shiny cupboards, and in these cupboards there are blades, and each blade uh, is called a standard node, and consists of, in case of joules, two times 24 cores uh, with 2.7 gigahertz. Uh, and it's hyper-threaded, meaning you can actually run uh, 96 threads or processes on one of these nodes. And uh, these nodes have uh, 12 times 8 gigabyte of RAM, uh, rem memory. Um, and that's not quite uh, much if you want to run a climate model, but I will come to that a little later. And in fact, in case of Jules, you have um, like three rows of five of these cupboards or something. And uh, so there are in total 2,271 uh, standard nodes, uh, 240 large memory nodes, and uh, 56 accelerated uh, uh, nodes consisting, uh, having something like GPUs. Um, and I tell you about Jules not because it's the fastest, actually it's maybe the 30th, uh, not even because it's the fastest in Germany, it was when it was built, but that's a while ago. Um, be but I told you about that because uh, uh, Jules provides actually a computing budget for the uh, ESM project, the Advanced Earth System Modeling Capacity, and so there are actually um, Earth system models run on that machine. Um, so what I told you before, there's not so much uh, memory on each node, so what you need to do is you need to cut down your problem and distribute it about the, uh, over the nodes, and then there needs to be some communication. So usually you, if, if the task is so simple, you can uh, cut down your grid and to put a number of grid cells to uh, each node, and then there's communication between the nodes on the boundaries uh, to solve the differential equations. Um, talking about grids, um, I would talk about the resolution, also again a history of resolution for, uh, of the climate models. For the first assessment report, uh, the re resolution was uh, 500 kilometers times 500 kilometers, and as I said before, you see these uh, um, two yellow, yellowish um, cells in the middle that are the Alps. Um, for the second uh, assessment report, uh, the resolution already uh, doubled or halved. Uh, 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 depends on how you want to phrase it. For the TAR, it was uh, 180 kilometers, and for AR4, it was 120 kilometers. Uh, for the AR5, it's a little bit a different section I show you. 
uh, and also um, I show you two resolutions. Uh, the, uh, there is the resolution for the higher um, models, which is um, 87, for example, 87.5 kilometers, and for the re uh, real, uh, very high resolution uh, with 30 kilometers. And uh, that's because um, climate models are not just one model, but there are different kinds of models that are coupled, and uh, each model has its own resolution. Um, so it's more or less like something like this. Uh, so we have a model for ice, we have a model for atmosphere, for ocean, and for terrestrial. Uh, and this is coupled, so they all send their data to a coupler or something, and that's set to the, uh, uh, as an input to the other model. Um, so this is more or less like um, how climate models look. And each of um, uh, the uh, models, again, has uh, several layers. For example, uh, the terrestrial layer um, has a groundwater part and um, the atmosphere. And um, so there's uh, some input from the atmosphere to um, uh, the soil and plant system. And then there's some water that is uh, sinking into the groundwater and then coming out to, to the rivers. Um, and uh, yeah, so then we have the runoff, so meaning rivers uh, get um, water. And then if you have a look to rivers and want to parallelize rivers, then it's not so easy because um, the, um, we have a source somewhere and the water has to go from the source or something that happens uh, at the source has an impact to the sink, meaning um, th th this ha has to communicate all the way along uh, to the sink. And uh, that's where I come in. I actually do, um, um, so I, I show you uh, the Danube, which you probably know better with the name Donau. Um, at a resolution of five kilometers. Um, and uh, I basically cut down the Danube in, into sub-river domains. Um, and we need, to, if we parallelize these, we need to calculate uh, the uh, sub-river domains that are farther away from the sink first. And uh, you see that in the first um, graph a little. So the grayish areas are calculated first, and then it goes down um, farther to uh, the sink. So just to tell you what I do. Um, the, now we come back to the main question. So we answered where the sources of, uh, where, where the graphs come from. Now we uh, answer the questions, what is uh, a representative concentration pathway, um, meaning what we all did before was more or less telling how we get to that black line in the first section, and now we concentrate on the colored part where we have more graphs than one. Uh, the, so um, the working group one of the IPCC generally tests a selection of coupled mod climate models, that is what I told you before, uh, matching specific conditions and investigates the output assuming different emission scenarios, meaning we have uh, coupled climate models that are somehow different, for example, in their um, grid. And then we have uh, input data. Uh, the input scenarios would be, for example, the first one, um, where we just do business as usual and don't reduce uh, carbon emissions. The second would be we um, start with our uh, way we do it today, but we would slowly change to uh, renewable energy, and the third one would be a scenario where we do it spontaneously now or so. And that is an input scenario that we put into the systems, uh, and then we get out uh, a model output that says something about the future. So there's a black line that says, okay, this uh, was uh, our history until today, and from that on, uh, we have three scenarios, and uh, they represented upper to lower, so uh, the upper, upper and right uh, line represent the, um, um, the way where we do nothing or so. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is basically what we do with uh, scenarios. And uh, the RCPs are scenarios, the RCP, representative concentration pathways, are scenarios that include time series of emissions and concentrations of the full suit of greenhouse gases and aerosols and chemical active gases, as well as land use and land cover. Um, so 
that is another graph from the AR5. Uh, it shows again uh, in the x-axis the years. It's the same time scale as before. But on the y-axis, we now have the radio, uh, rate of force, forcing uh, that is basically having this impact on uh, our climate. And so each of the RCP scenarios has uh, some kind of equivalent, equivalent in uh, radioactive forcing. And uh, the earth, uh, yeah, so we have uh, four, four of these scenarios. Um, the data for the RCP scenarios is co coordinated by, again, the input for MIPS, input database for model and comparison projects that I told you before. And most of it is freely available, and I gave you the link. So uh, if you want your, to run your own climate model and uh, test it with this input, uh, you can find it there. And now I will explain the last part, uh, the numbers and uncertainties. So first of all, again, to the graph from before, the numbers behind the RCP refer to the radiative forcing at the end of the modeling period of 2100, meaning if you follow one of these lines, for example, the red run, uh, to where it crosses the um, 2100 uh, line, then the number there is 8.5. So RCP 8.5 represent uh, is uh, the name for this um, RCP scenario. Then um, the numbers in these uh, different sections are the numbers of models used for this scenario in, the t in this time period. Um, yes, uh, so uh, as I said, there are lots of models intercompared, uh, compared, and uh, we even have different uh, models um, for the different time periods. So uh, until 200 and 100, there are, on, uh, there are uh, 39 uh, models for the RCP 8.5, and for the, uh, all the rest, uh, there are 12. And you see this little gap, um, this, uh, w uh, this line break uh, at 200 and 100, uh, 2100, and that is caused by the change of numbers of uh, models that took place, uh, that took part in this uh, project. And uh, another interesting thing that we th see here, and maybe the most important, is um, we have quite, uh, quite huge model uncertainties. So if we compare all the models, there's a huge band um, where we can't exactly say, okay, it's like this or that, but this band is still, um, um, but human uh, uncertainties are uh, more important uh, than this uh, model uncertainties. We see a tiny overlap, but mainly we can say uh, how the human behave derives our future. And um, that there will be this climate change we are talking about. So that was the main part about these uh, three parts. And it's also, um, it is also the um, most important part, now I could probably uh, show you uh, how you can install an impact model to your local PC, but probably I will uh, have um, maybe something like three minutes left and we'll, we'll switch to the conclusion. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe if it's arising as a question, I can do it. Um, so what have we learned? Um, whether is the physical state of the atmosphere at a given time, while climate is average weather. It is uh, for over 30 years. A climate model is a numerical representation of the climate system. Um, and we learned that uh, the main uncertainty uh, is the way we solve uh, differential equations. I would probably have told you what a differential equation is uh, in particular, but that would have taken maybe another lecture. Um, climate change is not proven throughout repeating one ex a real experiment over and over again. Uh, so there it is only one Earth, as said. But models simulate our past climate pretty well based on physical laws that were proven in real experiments. Uh, and then Maybe the most important message, human behavior is the primary source of climate change. Therefore, we talk about projections and not predictions, meaning if we wanted to um, predict uh, the climate, 
then we need it to simulate all human minds and what we will decide in future. But we don't. That would be another talk again. Um, we um, take what human will decide in future as an input scenario. And with this input scenarios, we create different output scenarios. So with different input scenarios, we create this different output scenarios uh, where we can tell, OK, when we behave like that, this is the output. And human behavior scenarios dominate model uncertainties, meaning the question is, what do we want? And um, if you go to a demonstration, the answer is usually climate justice. And I think that is a good answer. Thank you.